Um, welcome. I, even though I can't see you, and I don't even know if you can see me, um, I'm. We can see you. Oh, good. Because <laughs> I can't see me, um, which is a good thing. Um, so why APU? So why not APU? Um, we are some very important things you need to know about APU. We are nationally accredited. That's what CAPE means, which is extremely important when you're looking for programs. And we are obviously regionally accredited too. And as an APU alum, you can qualify for a discount, which is nice now. Um, also, this is kind of one of the things that's near and dear to my heart is our students have a wonderful reputation in our community. And so when a district hears that you're an APU alum, that, that is, they want, they want what APU students come out with and have to offer. So know that you're coming from a reputable, um, highly sought after um, institution. Another amazing bonus is that we have faith integration throughout and it is an encouragement, it is a support, it is a rock for you. And so, hello. <laughs> so um, I'm the single subject program director, which means I work with uh, secondary teacher candidates, those who are planning on teaching middle and high school students. And so from that perspective, I just will talk a little bit about our general and special education teachers and understanding education from a holistic perspective. Um, so our K-12 candidates look at uh, teaching from a more collaborative model, meaning we like to teach our candidates to understand that they are going to teach all students and that every student can learn and that they're going to have every type of student in their classroom and so our program is built around that understanding. And we have built our program in such a way that we have a co-teaching model. And that means that sometimes our candidates are going to have classes where there is a special educator and a general educator, meaning you have two professors teaching the course. And so it's really unique from that perspective because you're going to have the opportunity to learn um, from two professionals with very different perspectives. And so you get a much broader understanding of all the students in your classroom and therefore are much more prepared and ready to meet the needs of every child who comes through your doors. And that means that you are much more sought after by every school out there. The um, California standards for the teacher profession expect you to be able to meet the needs of every student in your classroom and uh, schools expect that now. And we have uh, an inclusive teaching model throughout California. So that's what we're looking for. We want collaboration. We want our students to be ready for that. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy. That was a great segue into, uh, I, I'm Dr. Bartholio. I currently serve as the department chair for special education. I also serve as the coordinator for the special education master's emphasis. And uh, I would just like to um, talk about the program sequence and the different components of our programs. It's my pleasure to uh, be with you today. And, and, I'm, and I'm happy that we have this opportunity to share about our program uh, using technology. But let me give you a little background. Back in 2017, the Division of Teacher Education redesigned our credential master's degree to create a sequence that threaded different strands of coursework through our program. We moved from a, a layered approach to a program that sequence, a program sequence that weaves foundation, specialty courses and emphasis courses together in a cohesive fashion to provide the candidate an integrated knowledge from multiple lenses as they complete their degree program. The program format for any credential is the same. Our six foundation courses were co-created by general and special education faculty members. We use this approach to build each foundation course on their perspectives. So as Dr. Kennedy mentioned earlier, in those six foundation courses, you're gonna get that perspective with the content from both general education and special education teachers uh, focused in the development of the courses. And also two of those courses are gonna be co-taught by with a general and special education professor and so in the 
instruction that you're going to receive, you're going to have the opportunity to hear both perspectives uh, within those within those courses. And why is that important? The CTC charged uh, educator preparation programs to develop a program that all candidates develop a shared scheme of knowledge through a common trunk of courses. Our common trunk of courses consists of six, un uh, six courses, 18 units. And by far that is the largest common trunk that any um, IHE is currently offering. When you graduate from our program, I just wanna uh, build upon what Dr. Canada said earlier, you leave with this wonderful general knowledge of understanding and how to address the learning needs of all students. And in the K-12 environment where collaboration and co-teaching is becoming more and more prevalent, graduating from our program will position you well to successfully navigate the K-12 environment as a novice teacher. Our program also has credential specific coursework that provides the discrete knowledge and skills and the expertise needed for your future success as a multiple single or educational specialist uh, teacher in the K-12 environment. Then of course, our program also has master's emphasis courses. And as you can see on the slide, they fall into the categories of teaching, special education, physical education, and learning and technology. For the teaching special ed and learning technology, those consist of 12 units of online courses. The PE has a little bit more, I believe it's 18 units to fulfill the, the master's emphasis of that credential and degree program because people that um, are getting a single subject in physical education, they can also do the emphasis in P physical education as their master's emphasis. So, uh, the last component of our program is that all credential candidates need to complete their clinical practice experience. And in doing so, when they do that, they will need to uh, satisfy their, their Cal TPA requirements. And so I, I hope that what you're getting is uh, the holistic perspective that our program provides you uh, from multiple lenses, and it will uh, allow you to graduate and be a well sought after candidate in the K-12 environment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bartholio. Next is Dr. Baser, who's gonna share about our emphasis options. You do have a wonderful opportunity to embed a master's degree within your credential. So it is embedded throughout. So you're looking at your whole credential through a lens. And so you have the opportunity to either choose a Master of Arts in Learning and Technology, which is, focuses on all those foundational tech tools um, to just create this powerful learning environment for your students utilizing technology. You also have an opportunity to choose from a Master in Teaching, which focuses on all those curriculum and best practices and applying teaching methods in the classroom. And then you have, next slide, <laughs> an opportunity to choose from special ed, um, which will focus, just dig down deeper into special ed to prepare you. That would be your emphasis. And then as mentioned, you have a PE emphasis that you can do too. So you're actually getting a Master of Arts in Education with an emphasis in the area that you choose. My apologies. Hi, everyone. Welcome. It's great to see all of you. I'm Dr. Gouda. I'm the program director for the special education credential programs. Um, and as it's already been touched on, we do have actually three starts um, entry points to our program. You can either start in fall semester, spring, or summer. And uh, the master's and credential embedded programs take three semesters, which is 16 months. We also have the option for those of you that are interested in the credential only program, if you're not yet uh, interested in a master's at this time, but we do highly recommend um, enrolling in the master's combination program that will suit you well um, as you go into your teaching profession and give you an additional edge with some expertise in one of your uh, emphasis areas. Um, the program is continuous, which does include uh, two courses in the summer session for all of our programs. And as already touched upon, your student teaching or clinical practice will take place in your final semester. Wonderful, thank you. And next, I believe we have Dr. Kennedy just to touch on um, 
field work and clinical practice. Okay, so uh, field work is basically embedded within the uh, first few courses of your program. So you have 60 hours of field work and you have probably already had a similar experience to field work right now. So in your EDLS 200 or 202, you have experienced your service hours and um, you were going into a classroom and experiencing some time with a host teacher. That's similar to our field work, but our field work is much more intense and um, it is embedded with assignments within your uh, foundation courses. And you'll have 15 hours for four foundation courses. And there are signature assignments that go with those 15 hours. And uh, you are going to be going to a host teacher for those 15 hours and uh, working with students and completing the signature assignments at the same time for those courses. And so you cannot do clinical practice, so your student or intern teaching later, until you have completed field work satisfactorily. So, Field work is exceptionally important and completing field work satisfactorily must happen in order to qualify for clinical practice. So you're gonna make sure that you do that. And you cannot pass your foundation courses as well if you have not finished field work because it is embedded within those foundation courses. It is part of the foundation courses. It's part of the, their assignments. So from that perspective, there's 60 hours. You have to complete it. It is um, built in. And so that's four courses over um, the 501, 502, 511, and 512 of the foundations. Now that consists of those assignments, observations, case studies, specific lessons you're teaching, giving assessments and, and working with specific students. Then um, clinical practice, and I'm assuming that's gonna be on the next slide. Okay, is then, as we've said a few times in your last semester, and that is going to be broken up into 16 weeks. And it depends on if you're a single subject, multiple or sped in terms of how that is broken up. If you are a single subject, your 16 weeks is all in one class. Okay, so single subject, if you're placed in, you know, a 10th grade world history class, um, you're going to be in the 10th grade course, like you're going to be in that grade level and in that placement the whole 16 weeks. Now you'll have however many, like you'll be with that host teacher, but you'll have more than one prep. What that means is that host teacher might have four world histories and one honors uh, American government. You know, they might have different uh, preps because you have to have more than one but you'll be with that same host teacher for 16 weeks in single subject, and you won't switch host teachers. In multiple subject, you're going to um, have a K through three for eight weeks, and then a four through six, so a, dish, a different um, placement for another eight weeks, because they want you to experience the different grade levels at multiple subjects, so you can get a feel for those different grade levels because multiple subjects, you don't know which grade level you're going to get. So they want you to have a different feeling for that. Now in clinical practice or student teaching, you will be completing your te teacher performance assessments. There are two cycles. In the first eight weeks of clinical practice is cycle one. In the second eight weeks is cycle two. These are state assessments. They are done through Pearson, but as you're completing them, you are doing them within your uh, clinical practice classroom. And we do support, we don't, we don't have like a, a specific, this is a class for this, but we're guiding you through the process. We have TPA coordinators who do uh, like actual Saturday sessions on this is how to do the TPA and they, they create podcasts and things like that to go over it. And then in your classes, they'll have, you know, 15 minutes to say, okay, what section of the TPA you're on and make sure you're doing this. They can't read your TPA. They're not allowed to give very, very specific 
feedback, but they are able to answer um, guiding questions, that kind of thing. And so you will have guidance on the, those TPAs to, to help you get through it. And so from that perspective, you will have guidance throughout that TPA process. Um, in terms of the uh, TPAs you and, and the clinical practice in general, you will have to apply for clinical practice. You have to clear for clinical practice. This means that you have had to complete field work on time. You have had to pass your subject matter competency. Now, for many of you, that will be your undergraduate degree in a waiver program. Um, so some of you are probably in a APU bachelor's degree program that has a waiver, but some of you are taking CSET exams. The CSET exams have to be passed prior to clinical practice, okay? Um, and you have to apply and have everything passed um, by October 30th or April 30th, depending on if it's a fall or if it's a um, spring application. Am I right on that? Um, Angela and Craig, I, I wanna make sure I'm right on, on my dates. It would be April 30 and September 30. September 30, thank you. Um, and so from that perspective, just make sure that you are getting your C sets done. I know in EDLS 200 and, and 202 and, and in your advising with Brian Hamlet and Paul Flores, et cetera, they tell you, hey, take your CSET now, take your CSET now, do that. So please do that um, because you have to have those passed in order to complete clinical practice. So from that perspective, you have to apply, you have to clear, you have to have your TB tests done. Um, that's a health thing. Um, and so that's, and then you can ask for where you want to be placed. You give your, your preferred placement. We don't guarantee that you'll be placed there, but we do try. Wonderful, thank you. Next is Leanne Kuhn. Oh, okay, Hi everyone, I'm Leanne Kuhn. I'm the director in the Office of Credentials and Dr. Kennedy talked to you about uh, clinical practice. One thing I don't see on our agenda is the fact that you can complete clinical practice in two ways. One is to do a standard teaching, uh, standard student teaching experience where um, you have a master teacher or cooperative teacher who is in the classroom with you the entire time and guides you through that. The other way is to complete, complete clinical practice in a paid intern teaching credential position, which means you would be the teacher of record. So there's two different ways to do that. But as Dr. Kennedy was saying, in order to do um, clinical practice in either one of those ways, you do have to have your subject matter authorization met. Um, and nowadays, because the testing centers um, may not be as available as normal, um, you definitely want to start looking for dates to do that. Um, you will have to have a TB test as mentioned and your US constitution passed, uh, which we will already clear uh, when you are admitted to our program. So the other really important thing that sometimes um, gets um, our candidates a little bit stuck is the certificate of clearance uh, or any valid CTC document. And you actually have to have this uh, for admission. So not just for clinical practice, but for admission. So this is where you are going to go and get your fingerprints done. Um, and you are going to apply to the CTC for a certificate of clearance which is valid for five years. So that's the entire time you are in our program. Um, and that's a precondition of our program um, given to us by the state in our standards, uh, because anytime you're going to be working with students, we wanna make sure that you um, have had a um, DOJ background check and that um, you're all good to go um, to be on campuses um, throughout Southern California. Um, the other way you can do that, though, is if you're already looking ahead and you've already applied for, uh, let's say, a 30-day sub-certificate or um, you have a um, 
uh, some any kind of instructional aid or any kind of a CTC document that you've gone through the uh, background check process. Um, all of that will be used during your application process, but it will also have to continue to be valid uh, for your clinical practice. So um, just one more note, if you haven't heard and you're not aware, um, APU does have uh, partnerships with two test prep companies to help you get those CSETs done. Um, and so uh, that just circles back to the importance of that. Um, I get to be the person who sends out monthly emails to remind you about CSET passage. So you'll hear from me a lot um, if you don't have those done um, at admission time. But we're excited to uh, let you know all this information. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Leanne. And before we transition to our next slide, which is about admissions requirements, and Kendall will be talking about that. I just wanna ask all of you to um, indicate, use the chat box and indicate what program, what specifically credential program are you interested? Are you interested in single subject? Um, if so, which content area, English, math, science, are you interested in multiple subjects um, or special education, mild to moderate or moderate to severe. So if you all could just take a moment to just indicate thank you in the chat box, that helps us kind of understand all of you and what your needs might be, questions might be. Um, thank you so much for doing that. And also in the chat box, so you'll have to scroll up a little bit and maybe after this is all settled down, I'll add it back in, but I uh, put in a link for the teacher's test prep or for test prep options um, for those deeply discounted programs. So I'll add that back in just in case any of you are interested in getting started with that early, which we highly encourage. Okay, so next we're going to talk about admissions with Kendall. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Kendall Orloff. I'm a School of Education program representative at our Orange County Regional Campus. So I'm going to walk you through the admissions requirements as well as some basic financial aid information. Now you can start your online application as soon as you're ready. Um, the great thing about our online application actually is that you don't have to have all of these requirements complete before getting started. You can actually create your online application, review your checklist, and upload items as you um, go along through the process. So I'm actually going to paste a link to get started with the online application in the chat after the meeting. If those of you want to start an online application with us, feel free to visit that link and get started whenever you're ready. Um, now, we have several requirements once you do start your online application, which include an app fee, $45, but this is waived for those of you that are APU alum. Um, we also require transcripts with your posted bachelor's degree, two recommendations um, that are actually sent out through the online application on an official APU form directly to your recommenders. And we ask that these are professional or academic references. So um, maybe asking your former supervisors or current supervisors or um, you know, a former professor um, from your undergrad program, those would all be great people to seek to provide a reference for you. We also ask that you provide a updated resume with any relevant work or volunteer experiences. And we often get asked if you have to have any education background before applying, and the answer is no. Um, but if you do have any experience in the classroom, working or volunteering, definitely include that on your resume and your application. Um, we also require a one to two page personal statement and there's a series of questions and prompts that they ask you to speak to in your personal statement and this is all outlined on the website and um, when you start your online application with us as well. Now Leanne just spoke about our certificate of clearance um, requirement. Again, this is your clearance ultimately to be in our public schools to complete those field work and clinical practice um, hours. Um, and that is a two-step process, which is your live scan fingerprinting and your online application with the Commission on Teacher Credentialing or the CTC. 
And we recommend getting started with this process sooner rather than later, um, as soon as you start your online application, because it can take some time, depending on when you apply, um, because they have a lot of applications to go through with the state. So definitely get started on that requirement soon. Um, and then everybody's favorite requirements, we have the test requirements. Um, we require the basic skills requirement, which can be satisfied a few different ways, actually. It can be satisfied with the successful passage of the CBEST, which is a reading, writing, and math exam. Um, or it could actually be satisfied with um, satisfactory ACT or SAT scores. So if you recall your former test scores out of high school for ACT or SAT and you feel like they might um, you know, be particularly high, um, check with your program representative. We can, we can definitely check to see if those would meet that requirement for you. And then um, finally, we do require the CSET, which is your subject matter competence requirement in the subject area of your choice. So if you're looking to be a high school math teacher or English teacher, you're gonna take a series of tests in that subject area. And if you are applying to one of our credential only programs, the CSETs do have to be completed and passed up front. And on our next slide, I believe we have some of our upcoming deadlines for those of you looking to apply within the next year. Our spring 2021 term is just around the corner and the applications are due November 30th. Um, for summer 2021, April 5th is going to be our deadline. And for next fall, um, we need applications in by July 31st. So keep those dates in mind when you're looking to apply. And we, we definitely understand, you know, at APU that applying to a credential program is extensive and there's a lot that goes into it. And so our program representatives are here to support you throughout this entire process. Um, so on the next slide, we actually have our Azusa program representatives that represent our programs at the main campus. Um, Yasmin represents multiple subject. Ethan represents our single subject. And for special education, our program representative is Leslie. And um, feel free to reach out to them early on in the process. We're here to walk you through any questions that you have along the way when you start your application. And if you're looking to apply to one of our other campuses and want to get connected with your program representative, contact our graduate admissions office and we can um, directly connect you with your representative at the campus you're looking to apply to. Now we also understand um, you know applying to a credential program is a, it's a personal and a professional commitment but it's also a financial one. Um, so here's some basic cost overview for those of you looking to you know um, see the cost breakdown. Our programs are 657 per unit. The base cost comes to around 28,908 to 30,879. And those of you that are APU alum are eligible for a discount. Um, so that's something you can ex expect. And we definitely understand this is you know, a major financial decision and we wanna make sure you get all your questions answered. So you're welcome to reach out to your student account specialist. We have Iris Cordova and Salisa Thomas and they are a great resource um, at whatever point you are in the process, whether you've started your application or not, feel free to direct any questions you have about financial aid options directly to them. Okay, and so we're going to transition um, back to Leanne Kuhn just to talk about the Office of Credentials and um, what they do and how they are here to support you as well. And um, I also just in preparation, if you are most more comfortable with using the chat box, I just want to let you all know, like, go ahead and use utilize the chat box and start entering in any questions that you have so we can look at those and be prepared to address those. We'll also give an opportunity after Leanne's um, presentation or portion to um, allow you to unmute your mics to ask any questions of our program or our chairs, directors, admissions, um, et cetera. So um, go ahead and utilize the chat box or again, if you could just be thinking of your questions and we'll give a time to unmute your mics shortly. Okay, Leanne, are you available? I am. Great. 
All right. So although we are called the Office of Credentials, we are really the School of Education Office of Admissions, Advising, and Credentialing. Um, so we, um, we have four amazing credential analysts. Um, and if you are not aware, Azusa Pacific is um, about the seventh or eighth largest credentialing institution in the state of California. Um, so we have four uh, great credential analysts who are here to answer your questions um, and help you along with the process. Um, we're not in the office right now, so feel free to contact any of those um, by your alpha uh, through email. Um, or if you have a general question and you're just not sure where it should go, um, there is a general SOE credentials email also listed on that slide. Let's see what's next. So, um, Nori, what's the next slide? There we go. Okay, so there's also some helpful, um, really helpful resources listed uh, here, um, and hopefully you have access to be able to click on um, those. Um, but the Office of Credentials website really ha is a wealth of information from everything about um, our programs to becoming an intern, um, lots of FAQs about what if I want to go to another state or can I do substitute teaching or things like that. So um, I would definitely recommend that you um, or encourage you to check out the Office of Credentials website. Um, there's also lots of great information on the CTC website, although sometimes it's hard to know what to look for. So you might want to start with our website and then move there if you um, have further questions. Um, the exams website is where you're going to go to register for all of your exams. And it's not just a place to register. There's also some really good um, uh, test prep information on there as well. Um, and we've talked a lot about the CSETs. Um, what we did not say was that if you are multiple subject or special ed, uh, we encourage you to take the multiple subject CSET subtest. So there are three of those. That's 101, 214, and 103. Um, and then if you are a single subject um, person, um, I, I, I wish we were in a classroom so I could have you raise your hands. But um, if you are currently uh, involved in one of our um, CTC approved subject matter uh, waiver programs, uh, in the area of, and I'm probably going to forget some, so math, English, music, social science, <laughs> uh, and PE is on the, in the teach out phase right now. But if you are currently involved in one of those programs, um, what you'll want to do is at the end of your program, you're going to want to contact your credential analyst to start the process to get your subject matter waiver letter from your program, and then you don't have to take your CSET. So um, you um, can avoid that and start working on some of the other requirements. Um, sometimes people want to get supplementary authorizations, meaning I'm, I'm a single subject English, but I also want to add some another subject. Um, there's information there about um, how to do that, as well as adding teaching credentials. Um, it's really very easy to make yourself super marketable by having multiple um, credential types, like um, you know, multiple subjects as well as single and or said. Um, and that just makes you super marketable when it's time for you to start looking for jobs or um, gives you um, greater opportunity when you get out into the job force. So, um, I would encourage you to take advantage of some of those resources. Not sure what's on the next slide. Okay. <laughs> great, thank you so much everyone. And we have had some great questions flooding in. And so I guess I'll just start going through them and then our program chairs, directors, um, admissions, Leanne, um, if you wouldn't mind chiming in. Um, so when is the best time to apply for financial aid before the next enrollment dates, especially for summer and fall? Mm, I'm wondering if, Kendall, would you be able to address that? 
Yeah, I could try to help out with that a little bit. Um, we definitely recommend reaching out to your financial aid counselor to get the specific date on when you need to have everything in um, because they'll be your best resource for that. Um, but they have um, said that the financial aid process starts after you're admitted. Um, to a program. So, you know, start your application to apply. Once you are formally accepted, then our financial aid specialist will step in and help um, help you through the paperwork process to, to filing for any, um, you know, financial aid resources you're looking to apply to, and they'll support you through that process. Great. Thank you. Um, and then here's a question about, can you teach special education with a multiple subject credential? Um, Dr. Bartholio or Guto, would you like to address that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, actually, you will not be able to. So to teach special education, you do need your credential either in uh, mild moderate disabilities or moderate to severe disabilities. And Perfect. what's great, and then, I just will add one thing really quick. I'm so sorry, Nori. Yeah. What's really great is we have our common trunk um, where you will attend the same foundation classes with students in other specialty mm -hmm. areas. And we do have many students who complete one credential program, let's say an embedded master's in credential program, and then they add another credential. So that is an option. If um, someone completes, let's say the multiple subject credential program with us and wants to then also complete a special education credential um, or other options, single subject, et cetera. That was perfect. Thank you so much for touching on that. I'd like to kind of um, group these two together. There's a question about field work and is it mostly completed in public, private, or charter schools or a mix? And then also um, hmm, there's a question about full-time, part-time, and if they could do these programs as full-time, including clinical practice. Can somebody, I'm not sure who would like to take the field work and clinical practice questions. I can cover it. Thank you. Um, so you're getting a public school credential. So the expectation is that you're going to be working in public schools and therefore field work should be done in a public school. But we have what's called memoranda of understanding with a variety of public schools that um, we get a list of schools that we uh, give and we say do your field work in these schools. And then if uh, for some reason you already have a job or position as you know, an aide in a school that you would like to work in as your field work, you would like to do your field work in, we have to approve it. And so we may look at a particular school and if it meets the demographic requirements that we have, and there are very specific demographic requirements that the state has because it has to be comparable to a public school, we will look at it and decide if it is acceptable. Um, but generally it's a public school. Now, some public charters, there are charter schools that fall under a public district. And so sometimes there is a charter school that might fall under a public district that would fall under the um, thing that would count, but in general public schools. In terms of the full or part-time would still be able to do these programs. Um, we have a lot of students who are subbing during the day and that is their job, they, they're working, or are, as Leanne was talking about earlier, interns. And so they are the teacher of record and that is their full-time work. And um, so they are working full-time as the teacher um, but we do recommend that when you hit clinical practice, you do not have extra jobs outside um, of what you're doing because it is a full-time job to be a student teacher in the classroom. You are on the school's schedule. So if the school starts at 7 a.m. and goes until three, you're there all day, five days a week, and you're doing your lesson planning and you're doing all of those things, you're on the school's schedule. And so we, we highly recommend that you plan for that and that you have an expectation that you're going to be working those hours. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, great, thank you. And I also wanted to reiterate full-time is two classes, right, per- um, Oh yes, our program term. goes from 4.45 to 9.30 mm -hmm. at night. So that's five hours and it's two days per week. And then, um, so from that perspective, you're going to have a very full load and that's just the in-class time. Now think about all the extra time you're going to be reading and doing homework and, and 
doing all this extra work outside of class. Mm -hmm. So consider that you are going to have a very full load. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, next question is about um, C set and C best and test locations. And again, I don't know if you want to address this, but I do know that we we do check um, regularly about availability of test um, you know locations and such. And I know that there are multiple locations, and so sometimes what people have suggested is if you're able to, to look beyond kind of your media area to see availability um, in other areas. But Leanne, do you want to touch on those two questions about CSET and CBEST? Sure. So um, that's true, what Nari just said. Um, it's really important that you extend your boundaries when you're looking for testing centers. Um, there are some current exceptions in place. If you are planning on applying uh, for spring of 2021, um, you definitely want to check with your program cord or excuse me, program representative, uh, because there are some current exceptions in place, knowing that this is all taking place. Um, the other thing that we've heard from students is that um, it's really important to go on, and it sounds crazy, but um, to go on like at least once a day to be looking for testing dates because oftentimes people schedule a test and then they cancel or reschedule and therefore that creates an opening. So if you just go on once and you're discouraged, you know, I can't find any test dates, um, that's probably not going to work best for you. Um, it's really important for you to be kind of on top of it daily. Um, if not more than once a day. So we've heard from students that that's been the way they've found. They've just kind of, you know, continued to refresh their screen and uh, throughout the day to find a, a date. Um, but you also want to make sure that you're choosing a date that you have enough time to prep for your test. So you certainly don't want to register for a test that's tomorrow if you haven't had any time to prep. And, um, you know, these, the, the CSET subtests are not easy. They are covering the amount of content that a person in a BA program would cover in a four year time span. So for example, the multiple subject um, CSET subtest, the three, you know, that's, that's content from four years of a BA program in a liberal arts subject matter waiver program. So, um, they're difficult tests and we want you to be successful. There's lots of people praying for your success, um, but you've got to do your part too. So make sure you're picking a test date that um, will give you enough time to prep. Um, so yeah, just checking those every day and then also checking with your program rep uh, about any kind of exceptions that might be in place for uh, your application purposes. Perfect, thank you. And then I just wanted to draw your attention to, I just um, added a little tiny URL for our test prep and wanted to encourage all of you. We love hearing that, all, that some of you are going online and checking for test dates. That's really exciting because the earlier, again, that you can get that done is great because as Dr. Kennedy shared, once you get into the program, it's pretty intense. It sounds like, oh, only two classes when you're used to taking a lot more, but um, remember that it is graduate level work and um, with all of the other components, required components like field experience and such, um, the time really gets away from you. And so, and the load is, is pretty heavy. And so again, we encourage you to do that early. Um, with teacher's test prep, again, you can access it through this link that's in the chat box. Um, you can actually take um, a practice test and it'll let you know the likelihood that you would uh, pass specific sections. And so I highly encourage you to take advantage of that resource that's free for you to do the diagnostic exam through teacher's test prep, um, just to get a sense of how you will fare in the test, okay? Um, so there's a question about does APU offer the credential master's program in the online format? Um, if so, can we choose our clinical practice that are close to our home if we're not living in Azusa? Um, 
the online format, I don't know, Dr. Baser, would you want to talk about kind of the kind of breakdown of the online portion of it versus the face-to-face -face portion? Sure. So all of your emphasis coursework, um, which is just 12 units though of the package, 12 to 18, depending on if you have PE, is completely online and it will always be online, COVID or not. <laughs> okay, so that is 100% online. But your credential work um, that you're doing is not completely online. Some of your classes might be, but it's not, you know, don't, it's best not to think of it that way. So that's why we have our regional campuses and everything. And somebody else can chime in on this also. But just so you know, our credential master's program is not a completely online program. Okay. Just portions of it are. Does that help? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. And um, if there's any follow up questions, go ahead, either add it to the chat box or feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, Leanne, would you be able to talk about the degree waiver programs? Because there's a question about how do you know if you're in an undergrad degree waiver program and then who do you contact? Sure. So um, I, I would think that you would know if you're in a CTC approved waiver program. Um, however, if you want to check uh, and you are in uh, the English department, you should contact uh, Dr. Sipper. Um, we have a math approved program and you would wanna contact the um, uh, Dr. Arvidson uh, for that. For music, the director of music education is uh, Dr. Burnett, Burdett, excuse me, John Burdett. And for social science, it is uh, the department chair is Dr. Daniel Palm. Um, now you may be in the PE kinesiology with the physical ed emphasis, um, and those folks should contact um, Dr. Sharon Lehman. Uh, for that information. So basically the bottom line is I would say, if you are really unsure, you should be reaching out to um, your department chair uh, or um, uh, program uh, lead out there. I'm not sure what they are in undergrad as far as how they name them, but um, there's lots of people out there that can help. And definitely you wanna reach out to them and find out uh, if you will qualify for that so that you can skip your CSET. Um, wonderful. I have a follow-up question and let me see if I can attempt it, but it says, are waivers going by concentrations? And sorry, I'm just um, addressing this one further down because it's related. And so subject matter waiver program. So say if you're in a, English program and you want to become a single subject English teacher and you're in the subject matter waiver program in English at APU, again, um, Leanne shared about Dr. Sipper is the contact person for that, then that means that if you completed that program, I think we get a letter or something from the department and then you don't have to take the CSET in that area. Yes. Do you want to I, add I, anything I... to that? I do. Yeah, um, I think Paul might be best at answering this, actually. Um, Dr. Okay. Flores, I think that the concentration probably was chosen because it leads to the waiver. Am I right on that? Uh, yes and no. Probably. So for the multiple subject or the liberal studies program, you do a concentration, but that leads to a supplemental authorization, mm -hmm. which gets attached to your multiple subject credential which then gives you authorization to teach that subject area up to ninth grade. Okay, but like the, the English concentration, what about that? Is that towards the waiver or the social science concentration? Correct. No? Yeah. So all those concentrations could be go could go toward the waiver program, but the waiver program for single subject is a lot, there's a lot more additional classes because it it's goes additional. all through AP, basically AP of that particular subject. Okay, area. because I know my PE candidates, um, in NPE are all always telling me that they are specifically working with Cindy Tannis towards the waiver, for instance. Right. Yeah, so I think your students are in the single subject waiver program for PE, and but they're in your class because under under liberal studies. But okay. like the 200 class, generally those students are special education or liberal studies or multiple subject 
candidates. Okay. Okay. See, and I have the 202 right now. So right. yeah. So you're, you're more, you're going to be more single subject. Student. Okay. So, so maybe for the single subject people, I have five of them in this, in this meeting right now, but you would want to talk to those uh, chairs anyway to check in and make sure that you are taking the right concentration coursework. Because while you may have an English concentration, you need to make certain that it has the full course load for that waiver. Okay. Correct. That would be like Haley, Haley on here who's been working with Dr. Sipper um, mm -hmm. in that concentration in the English department, not the concentration in the liberal studies department. Right. Okay. So, so that's just specifically to, the, I'm, I'm as single subject person, I just wanted to speak to the single subject people because yeah. <laughs> Hopefully that clarifies. If there's still some confusion, please feel free to um, add your questions to the chat box. We have seven more minutes and a few more questions. And if any additional ones come in, we'll try our best to address those. Um, here's a special education uh, question for Dr. Bartholio or Guta. What is the transition into special ed moderate to severe credential program What's that like for students who didn't take any undergraduate coursework in liberal studies? So I could, I could speak into that and Dr. Gouda can also speak into that. So the beautiful thing about uh, going into special education is that you really, uh, it really doesn't depend on your undergraduate degree. Uh, you know, you don't have to get an undergraduate degree in liberal studies or psychology or sociology or something like that. Um, it helps. Uh, it can help because it can give you that foundational knowledge regarding psychological processes or human development and, and things like that. However, um, uh, you will receive the requisite knowledge and skills and expertise that you will need to be successful within our credential master's program. The, we are not a, um, as this discussion was uh, talked about kind of earlier, our graduate credential master's program is not a subject matter program where you do the subject matter within our credential program. That is determined based on whether you completed a subject matter waiver program as an undergraduate or you take the CSETs. And so we are a professional preparation program. And so we dive directly into the knowledge and skills that you're going to need to be a successful teacher. The content, uh, and then that's what I'm referring to when I talk about the multiple subject C sets, that is the content that you should be uh, knowledgeable of and familiar with because your educational specialist credential is a K through 12 credential. So you could teach the spectrum of students and in, even into transition age, uh, if you're not familiar with special education, uh, for those that do not receive a uh, high school, an official high school diploma, but still are eligible for special education services up to the age of 22, districts often have a, a transition class for students that are 18 to 21 year olds um, that really focus on, you know, how do we transition these students into the work world or into, you know, their next uh, environment that they're gonna be in. And so we recommend candidates come in and complete the multiple subject uh, C sets, although you can complete other C sets to have that subject matter waiver, but then that really kind of limits your job potential, that really limits your um, uh, ability to find that specific uh, job at a, within a K-12 school district. Uh, for example, I've, I've been here for 10 years. I've had maybe three or four individuals come to me and say, all I wanna be is an RSP math teacher. And so all they did was take the math C sets. They did student teaching in a math in environment at a seventh or uh, at a junior high or high school level. But then after they finished their credential, what job can they get? They need to be a math RSP or math SDC teacher. That's all they wanted. And so I believe that they're successful in that. So some people come to our program with a specific focus within special education of a specific academic dom domain that they want to teach. Um, we recommend the multiple subject C sets that gives you the flexibility of being hired in K through 12 environment. Uh, a lot of our candidates want to teach at the elementary school level. So that multiple subject 
uh, CSET is perfect. For those that want to teach at the secondary level, the multiple subject CSET is wonderful as well. However, sometimes students will get hired at a school district, whether it's a high school unified school district or just a unified K-12 school district. And then once they are hired and they start teaching at a junior high or high school level, the district themselves may have some requirements that they want you to uh, do to become more proficient in the academic domain that they're asking you to teach. Um, but that's above and beyond, you know, our program and you will have your preliminary credential. And so that is something that you would do post hired, you know, when you're hired. Um, so I'm gonna stop there to see if Angela Gouda or Dr. Gouda has anything else that she'd like to add. No, thank you Dr. Yeah. Bartolio for covering that. Okay. I, can I say one thing? I'm sorry. No, uh, go yeah. ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll pause. Sure. Um, we just have two more minutes. I want to be mindful of everybody's time. So if it's okay, unless there was, is there one more thing you wanted to share, Dr. Barcelio? Um, uh, one of the questions was, is it possible to be a student athlete during this program? Yes. And so I, um, I, I'm not sure what they're referring to because we're, I think we're still discussing the graduate program that we have, um, but we APU does have an integrated bachelor's where as an undergraduate student, you can complete a undergraduate degree and either a single subject credential in mathematics, allied health with an undergraduate degree in mathematics or allied health, or you can get your educational specialist credential with an undergraduate degree in liberal studies. And so I've had conversations with current undergraduates at APU who are a student athlete who would like to know, is this possible? And um, traditionally, it, uh, it's, I always ask, it really depends on the schedule of your sport, because at that last semester that we talked about, you are student teaching. So Monday through Friday, you are busy on uh, normal teacher hours, plus you are taking coursework afterwards. And so, um, that is traditionally the time that sports are occurring, either practices occurring or events or competitions are occurring uh, at night or the weekend. And so mm -hmm. traditionally my answer is, I, I don't think so, you know, because I think it'd be very difficult to be a student athlete and participate in uh, this, your sport during the semester they're doing clinical practice because there, there seems to be a time conflict. And so um, I, I just Thank wanted you. to, kind of answer that question, yeah. Thank you so much. So two more questions I wanna make sure we um, touch on. Very quickly, Leanne, could you talk about applying to different credential programs and the fingerprinting? Does that need to be done each time at multiple locations? Yeah, so once you get a CTC document, once you've applied and it's been granted, you've done your fingerprints, that document is your document to take with you wherever you go. So you can use it to apply to any um, uh, credential program, uh, but you can also use it uh, at districts to um, you know, access uh, district campuses as well. So it's, it's your document to take with you wherever you go. Thank you so much. Um, quick, so last two questions and one Dr. Flores, um, shared in a private chat um, before we get to that, which is a really critical um, question. Somebody wants to know about substitute teaching and can they do that while they're in our program? And I almost wonder too, if part of a uh, part two of that question is about um, maybe even satisfying clinical practice through a long-term subposition. Who could talk about that? I, I, I I can speak into Thank that you. and also Dr. Kennedy and Dr. Guda as well. Um, we do have candidates that come to our program with their bachelors and have passed the CSETs and have been hired by local school district or school districts to serve as a substitute teacher. And so one of the, uh, our graduate program, our courses start at 445 and go to 930. So it actually allows individuals the flexibility to be a substitute teacher for districts. The Question is, will substitute teaching fulfill the required field experience hours and the field experience responsibilities that each candidate has within those four courses? Because every course that has field experience has a different focus, 
different requirements. And so, yes, you could be a substitute teacher while you're in our program. Uh, you may have to take time where you're not a substitute teacher in order to complete field experience requirements that meet the requirements of those four specific field experience embedded courses at your foundation courses. No, substitute teaching cannot count for clinical practice. If at some point you are in a position to be uh, transferred over to and be recommended for an intern credential, you can complete your clinical practice as an intern. Uh, that needs to be done before uh, a certain time period. Right now, um, we individuals need to become an intern prior to their second block of clinical practice. So there is some space in the program. Of course, there are some program requirements that you need to complete in order to be eligible to be recommended uh, for an intern credential. So I hope Perfect. that answers Thank the question. You. Thank you. Um, last question, uh, Dr. Flores submitted, and really I'm wondering, there's some students who have um, some extra units in their traditional undergrad program, and um, they are interested in starting the credential program. Who should they contact? Can that be done? Um, can somebody talk, speak to that about an undergraduate who has extra units? and maybe in their last year semester, they would like to start the graduate program. Okay, so uh, yeah, you can do that. It's, it's rare, but you have to have, there's, there's a form that you get. Um, I'm trying, I, I'm actually just going back through my emails, trying to find the name of the form um, because you get it through the uh, academic advising. Um, I wanna say it's UEGS at, apu.edu, something like that, undergraduate academic advising people, I'll find the email. But um, so you fill out this form and you um, have to get it signed by the um, undergraduate advising first saying that you have approvals and that you have this these courses you're taking and then you get it signed by the graduate program approving it as well. So there's there's a whole process um, because you, you have to get approval that you can do the load from both programs. Um, and it's, it's sort of a, a full process and it ends up going under your undergraduate credits and coursework, et cetera. Um, and so it's rare that we do it and it's, it's only for seniors at the very end of a program. And so um, if you're interested, you'd want to meet with your advisor beforehand to, to make that decision. And so they would um, talk to their undergraduate advisor, Dr. Kennedy? First. So um, Dr. Okay. Flores, do you want to add anything to that? I know you've done it more than I have. I only usually do it when they come to me after they've already talked to advising. Great. Yes, yeah, so I think the, the, the route is like what you said, you go to UESC, you get that form, permission to take graduate courses as an undergraduate. You do have to get accepted into the credential program though. So, so there may be a, a way, and Jessica, you can probably help me with that, or Leanne, that they, they go through, get accepted to the credential program. And then, then when they have that form, they come to me and then they go to if it's subject or <laughs> It, it actually always goes through the form first, and then I decide whether I'm going to accept them. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, then we start with the form, and then, yeah. so, and then do they have to apply to the, to the credential program as well? Mm -hmm. or grad school? Yeah. Grad school? yeah. From, my, from, from my experience that they, <clears throat> they are applying to the credential slash master's program uh, as an undergraduate. And so, they... They are conditionally admitted because one of the requirements to be accepted into the master's graduate program is that they have a bachelor's degree, which obviously they don't. But uh, this application would need to happen sometime in the fall semester for decisions to be made because we need time to review the candidate's application package to make that form decision to have that conversation between the undergraduate advisors and the program director of the of the program that you're asking to go into, whether it's single subject like Dr. Kennedy or uh, educational specialist, uh, Dr. Gouda or multiple subject, that'd be Dr. Uh, Haas Brinkley. And 
quite often uh, the, the maximum number of units you could take as an undergraduate that counts for both undergraduate and graduate is nine units. And so that's something also to keep in mind as well. Yeah. Right, yeah. So like, like Dr. Kennedy said, it, it's rare because you have to have enough space in your undergrad schedule to take uh, module one and module two. But there, there's one of you, at least I know for sure that has that, and there may be others of you. The benefit would be it gets, it gets you finish half your, in a sense, a couple of uh, terms of your credential at the undergraduate tuition rate, but then only only a certain amount of classes can also count toward your master's degree. So not all of them count toward your master's degree. However, moving forward though, you finish your credential as a graduate student, and then you decide if you wanna finish your master's, you'd probably work with the master's people and take additional courses or electives to finish the master's. Yes, and that's really important to understand. You still have units to finish in the master's. Okay, thank you. Um, last question, and thank you. I know that we've gone over time, um, but I think it's really important that we're able to address your questions. There's a last question on our recommendation regarding taking all subsets at once or one at a time. So I would definitely encourage you to take one at a time, um, especially because um, let's say for the multiple subject subtests, there are the three that we discussed. Uh, each one of those covers some pretty hefty subjects and I don't know them uh, by heart, but uh, one is uh, you know math and English, one is art and uh, history and science, and one is art and several other things. So they're pretty hefty um, topics in each one of those subtests. Um, and we would rather you be successful one at a time than to pay and take subtests that then you are unsuccessful at. Um, they are pricey. I want to say somewhere in the, in the range of $180 each. And so uh, when you think about that, that's, you know, you want to make sure that you're fully prepared um, and you're not, you know, wasting that, um, that money. Um, I have had some people say, well, I just took the subtest to see kind of what was on it, but I wouldn't encourage you to do that. I would encourage you to look at test prep materials instead. Um, and like I said, on the CTC exam site, there are actual release test questions from previous subtests that you can look at and get an idea of how questions are worded and, and um, you know, just kind of get yourself uh, in the right place for taking those. But definitely take advantage of uh, one or both of the test prep programs that APU is involved in uh, and take one subtest at a time. Yeah, thank you, Leanne. Yeah, and once again, I just wanna circle back and encourage you to take the diagnostic exam through teacher's test prep and perhaps that's how you can kind of prioritize what tests you'll take. Like those, it'll say like very likely to pass, unlikely to pass, needs, you know, a lot of work and so, maybe just prioritize based on how likely it looks that you'll pass that section, and get those easier ones or those ones you're likely to pass um, done right away. And then how do you waive the CBEST uh, with the SAT score? Actually, I'm going to share the link to the Credential Analyst website. Um, or Leanne, could you put that in the chat? Would you mind? because that gives information on what is needed to meet um, the, uh, I, not CBEST, but the meet the basic skills requirements. Okay. So we'll go ahead and paste her, the credential analyst website right there. And then you'll have access to that. What I also want to do is because we've gone over time is I wanna share the general School of Education um, email. If you have any other questions, you can direct them to school of ed at apu.edu. And that actually comes to me and Amy, who's also on this call and we will direct it to the right person. So if you have follow-up questions, please use the school of ed at apu.edu and we'll direct you to the right person. So apologize for going over time. We hope that you found this time of questions and answers valuable. And just wanna thank you for your interest in the program and encourage you to, again, take advantage of our test prep 
um, resources. Contact us if you have any questions. If you're interested, I encourage you as well to get started on the graduate application and um, our program representatives will be in contact with you once you initiate that um, to kind of walk you through the process. So that last link is a link to the applications and feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Thank you again, everyone for your time and um, both on School of Education side and all of those of you who have tuned in. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you.